This is the 1st of November, 1994. Today is my first day of writing the new Star Wars series. I took my kids to school this morning. Uh, my oldest daughter was sick all night. I got no sleep whatsoever. This is my life. This is the hole I live in, a cave I hibernated. I have beautiful, pristine yellow tablets ready to go. Nice fresh blocks of pencils. I'm all set. All I need is an idea. The original notes and the original outline are uh, 15 pages. And this whole early part was written to set up the films that were made. I had to sort of figure out who everybody was, where they came from, how they got got to be where they were, and what the dynamic relationships were between everybody. There is drama inherent in it because there is a lot of betrayal and a lot of things like that going on. Uh, but a lot of the subtleties of the story and the intricate weaving of themes and everything hasn't really been done at all. This book was put together when I was, um, actually I was writing, I think I wrote graffiti in this book actually. I wrote graffiti and all the Star Wars in this book. It's great to be able to sit by myself and just be able to do this. Uh, it's a, like a real luxury, actually. And, um, you know, I don't feel a lot of pressure. It's kind of fun. I'm getting to do a lot of research, which I love to do, and uh, I'm getting a chance to think. How? How good is that? I get to do a lot of things now that I couldn't do before. Create things that weren't possible to create before. I was always, and I will be on this, but I've always been sort of at the limit of what is possible uh, in terms of storytelling. Things have advanced so far in the last 20 years in terms of your ability to portray things on the screen that were just literally impossible before. I think about the scenes all the time, and uh, uh, you know they, they come in a mosaic, and then eventually all the pieces come together. And then there'll be some missing ones, and then I have to sort of sit down and really work hard to get from point A to point B. My oldest daughter was born during Jedi. Since then, I slowed down quite a bit, and I focused more on my family. This is going to be the first time I go back and try to do a movie of this scale with this much intensity. It starts with me sitting here doodling in my little binder, but it ends up with a couple thousand people working together in a very, very intense, emotional, creative way to pull it off. And, you know, it goes from you know, my nannies, to the producers, to the camera crews, uh, to ILM. I mean, it's all right here, it's just a dream. It's just a kind of a, a thing that I can sit here and do and say, wouldn't it be great if? And then pounding that into reality takes a huge amount of effort. The interesting part for me is, you know, I started all by myself. And then, uh, almost immediately, within about three or four months of starting to write the scripts, I brought in Doug and a few of the other designers. And then we, you know, there's a little group, and then we started building that little group that's the design group from the attic. And um, we worked for two and a half years together. And what I've done is, you know, over those two and a half years, spent huge amounts of time uh, approving, changing, and finalizing designs for things. Uh, you know, thousands of things. Fine art was very important, especially to the Queen's people. 
And they really appreciate it. You can tell in their architecture, their sculpture, and their clothing, and, and so forth. And in episode one, that element naturally carries over to their hardware or their vehicles. I grew up on certain types of science fiction films. I was a big science fiction fanatic as a kid. But when I saw Star Wars, I was really blown away, but I was actually kind of like, hmm, there are certain things that I didn't like about it. But the great thing was I went home and I kind of drew, you know, my version of the X-Wing. I'd make uh, this cockpit about a quarter of the size that it is, and I'd stick it back here. And then I'd take the engine part and I'd sort of cut this part off right here. Just I started with a staff of two, and we were given a huge list of vehicles, creatures, environments, and whatnot to design. And it was just a matter of sitting down and trying to comprehend, you know, where to start first, and then how to design something that will live up to the expectations of everybody that's going to see this film. George is very reactive, and he likes to kind of see things. And he basically just said, you know, I need single-person fighters and shuttles and so forth. So this is like a small shuttle type thing? Well, that's because those technical questions. <laughs> it's neat, that's all. My decisions on what is aesthetically pleasing is really hard to nail down because what I like is, you know, obviously going to be different from what somebody else likes. You know, it's a matter of getting in sync with George, and I hope that I've kind of gotten in sync with George on this film. For the Starfighter, um, the good guys, it started out very differently because I initially thought that the ships would be very angular, like the X-Wing, but George um, wanted to go more towards the handcrafted look. George would come in every Friday for our weekly meetings, and it was very difficult sometimes because we spent a lot of time and energy to you know, draw beautiful drawings, and we put them up on the wall, and George will dismiss these designs very quickly. And it took me a while to get used to it because one of our first couple of meetings, I would put up a wall full of designs, and he would look at it literally after 10 seconds there, like this one, this one, this one. Episodes four, five, and six kind of had the um, industrial mentality in terms of spaceships were punched out. They were kind of like plastic materials. Things were kind of mass produced. It kind of happened with the you know, industrial design in the United States. We had, you know, an era in the 20s and 30s where things were more romantic and the craftsmen were the king. But then slowly as the industrial revolution took over, machinery and, and mass production became the norm. I don't, I'm not quite sure if this is George's take, but for me, when that pattern clicked, everything made sense in terms of designing for this film. I was very clever in the first Star Wars films in that I, I kept the design very simple. And I invo avoided situations where I was gonna get into trouble design-wise. This one I'm daring to take the chance and see what happens. I think about this constantly. I mean, it's going to the third year, and there hasn't been a day or an hour where I haven't thought of something that could work. On the Starfighter alone, we went through easily three dozen drawings. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. That's only one vehicle in a world populated by many vehicles, many creatures, everything. For weathering, to see if this is the right amount, too much, not enough, what your general reaction is. I would say this is the most distressed. Okay. And then they can do minor, less versions of this. Okay. Now, the other thing that we haven't really addressed is like paint chips and things. Do you want to I see think that? We can keep it pretty much the way it is. I mean, the, the one thing that I would tone down a little bit is this. Okay. It's got a little too dirty. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. The whole point of this is what works for the story. Um, it could be the coolest thing, but if people don't know what it is or how it works in five seconds, it doesn't matter.
the, the first full-size set that was started two weeks ago is Anakin's interior. I think that'll be the first set that George, George will see in about, I say, in about five or six weeks' time. This is the reworkings of Anakin's, with an entranceway mm -hmm. into there. Yeah. Added an extra little alcove on this side, and the doorway straight out. It should feel small. Yeah. So I'd definitely bring the ceiling down. Yeah, I would bring the whole thing down and make it, you know, kind of a little hobble-ish. We're, we're eight weeks away from production now. Well, we're eight weeks away from shooting, and the adrenaline's pumping, and we're churning things out as though there's no tomorrow. When you got to have this finished by? Tomorrow. <laughs> You'll need to bend a tube there and the intermediate one in here. Yes. Rake up here, we're going yeah. to put a decking up here. Yeah. And that forms our platform. Excellent. Anakin's Hub was quite an interesting one because obviously it was back in Tatooine and George wanted it to have um, a certain feel of the homestead from Star Wars. The look of the movie is very, very important, and you want to develop a look that, that doesn't call attention to itself, that is very natural, but is very unusual at the same time, and gives you this sense of an otherworldly situation. So, we could take this out, yes, and then we can sort of dress, and use it for real, dress yeah. this with, with parts, yeah, whatnot, which would be great. That would look good. George was saying, you know, let's make it like any nine-year-old kid's bedroom. But, of course, he lives in Tatooine, which is kind of slightly different. Now, if you don't mind, I'd just like to wander around a couple of the sets. Yep, we're um, ready. Are we? Okay, we are. Just you? Yeah. Well, I saw some of the photos of the set starting to go up. Yep. Home sweet home. All right, great. Okay. We've never dared. We've never dared go this far. <laughs> but uh, it's sort of the first intimate area mm -hmm. you've had, almost, isn't it? Yeah, it is. We never saw Luke's bedroom. bedroom one thing, yeah. Yeah. You know, it is important that we make this a, a warm boys' room. Yeah. Yeah. You know? It's only nine. I'm not sure about a closet, but we could hang we around on the bed. Well, you could put you could put a closet over there. In our 20th century environment, uh, the majority of things just blend in. It's not until you lay on your bed and you start to count all those different bits and pieces that you've got there that go to make up your own set at home that you realise that you're actually recreating an environment like that, but in a completely different world. 72, pick up my big cameras. Well, I'd like to introduce you to Ty Teager, who's our prop master Hi, nice and an integral part of our team with all the boys that we've got working here. Probably the best bunch of hooligans I've ever worked with in my life. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. You're a darling. <laughs> so, this is kind of our prop store. These came out of mainframe computers, which we'll either use as dressing or incorporate into something else. Um, and in fact, already we've sort of taken half of them and put them in the panels in Anakin's room. All of this will be things that will be used in the Tatooine Street in the markets for displaying fruit and vegetables or whatever the guys might be selling. And we've just let the boys have their head and yeah. say, look, you know, imagine that you're going to be selling something down in Covent Garden, but it's not, it's the Tatooine Street. I think these are gaskets, aren't they? Yeah, those are Possibly. gaskets. Yeah. That's an aerial off uh... Fighter aeroplane. Um, Held together with lots of very strong glue. Yep. Very strong, <laughs> believe it or not. I mean, the only way you can actually realise what you do is by getting the boys here to actually come up with ideas. What do you call it? Gizmo, techno sort of looking sci fi equipment, really. 
It's boys in paradise, really. Yes, yes, Doing all boys it's a boys stuff. Film. It's a boys film. <laughs> Unless, of course, we were women, and then it would be <laughs> women doing a boys film. I feel like I'm in some guerrilla army <laughs> polishing guns. just like doing a sculpture. We'd have the base of the gun, and then we start to put things together like a jigsaw and say, well, that looks good on the top there. Uh, and all of a sudden, you've got a finished article. You know, when George comes over, we have everything nicely laid out, rather than saying, oh, there's a bit over here, George, there's a bit over there, there's a bit over there. Um, because he, he wants to be able to see it in its nicest possible way. Yeah, um, it's like having an exhibition every time he comes over. That's a very basically. good way of putting it, yeah. Attachment for when he fires the cable. So what we're thinking of doing is making these out of a cast which actually fit onto the gun, which yeah. can then take off the fire. Perfect. So that'll be on there, and then bang. These are actually castings of the, the real original, but I think they're, um, they're a gun that's held over like that. These are the machine guns, yeah, dummy machine guns. I mean, obviously, they're making real shooting versions of these as well. There's a shot where they all pull the guns out of the holsters and put the rockets in the end like that. Bang. Binoculars. Very good, everybody looks so close. Uh -huh. Should be something nice. That was going to be the com link for the Jedi. No, that's good. Okay. Okay. We always a bit selfish. We'd like yes. as much stuff to be seen as possible. Yeah. And like the piece that you were spinning, yeah. I mean, that's a fabulous part. And maybe before they turn over, George will just have it spinning slightly. Um, and things like that almost build up, don't they? They might actually start on that and pull out and reveal everything else, you know. Thanks a lot. The story is the most important, not the props. And you've got to get used to that. But it is the actors that are the most important, obviously. Um, you know, we're just the background stuff, really. Well, as you can see, guys, that was a, <laughs> an amazing tense situation between me and George Lucas, and we did OK. Thank you very much. Does he speak? No. No, no, no sound. No. Well, they'll probably put some noises. Some sound track. No. Yeah. He's just one of the senators. So he's almost a cutaway. They've got tons of these <laughs> with just a few shots yeah. in the middle of a main major uh, scene. But it's great that we've brought over all the old stuff. We've got the original Yoda here. Have you got the original Yoda? And the original Chewbacca, oh, which we're not allowed to damage or touch or alter no. because they're iconic. All the, the Einstein lines. I had to get the... <laughs> Something that was subconsciously registered in people's minds. They, they'd recognised something vaguely, I hoped. And it seemed to work somehow or another. <laughs> there is another theory. <laughs> yeah, there is a bit of me in it too. Yeah. <laughs> the comic bits. <laughs> <laughs> so there it is. This, this actually snarls and comes up, should come up quite a bit. Yeah, it, that still does. Mm. So does that one. Yeah. If the, foam, uh, if the foam hadn't deteriorated, mm. it would still work. Yeah. It's not too bad, actually. And it does, the jaw does open, I imagine, a bit, doesn't it? Yeah. Should do it. Oh, yes. Yeah. Is the tongue still movable? It's a little bit on the stiff side. Yeah. Apart from changing from foam latex to silicon, yeah. because we're going to do the skin in silicon, which I'll show you when we get back there. Silicon foam? No, silicon rubber. Uh, it's I not mean, foam, yeah. It's, it's but it's Oh, yeah, silicon rubber. Yeah, and of course, it's, yeah. it's, um, it, it's because basically it can be Softer. translucent and yes. you can make it very soft. Mm. Oh. Even the eyelids. Can you make the left eyelids? Uh, yeah, make them blink and, and the right eyebrow go up at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> I told you it was tough. <laughs> <laughs> the snarling. 
No, that's very good indeed. My goodness, that's great. All radio controls. Lovely. Creature shop? We're doing, goodness. We're doing frogs, alien frogs for yes. particular scenes. Everyone's done a frog. This is a creature film, isn't it? Right? Yeah, one or two, <laughs> yes. Sometimes something something wrong about a certain head, but... Oh, we've got one of them. Yes. I don't know. Well, you've put them in the back room, because <laughs> what I've seen now, it, it's all got something. It's some character in it. So, Stuart, we thought that we should do something to mark your visit. This is for you. <laughs> My goodness. And it's from all of us. Oh, that's fantastic. You. Oh, that is fantastic. That's incredible. Oh, that is fantastic. Well, well, well. Okay, come forward a bit. Yeah. Okay, when you ready? Ready. Okay. Action. I was looking for a kind of sword fighting that was reminiscent of what was in the movies that we'd already done, but a more energized version of it because we'd actually never seen real Jedis at work. We'd only seen, you know, old men and crippled half droid, half men, and young boys that had learned from these people. So to see a, a Jedi fighting in the prime of the Jedi, I wanted it to be a much more energetic and, and faster version of what we've been doing. <laughs> I'm Nick Gillard, I'm the stunt coordinator. When I was 12, I was sent to military school, which I hated, so I, I left and ran away to the circus. I got on the stunt register when I was 18. If you get caught on your toes, just step back and then go in. Just try that. There's no room for error in any of the fights. You won't see it because they're so fast, but if you slow them down and freeze frame them, they can only parry there or they can only attack there. But the moves are so natural uh, or so correct, it's the only place they can be. Since they had chosen such a short range weapon, they would have to be so good if they're up against ray guns and lasers. So they would have studied every great sword fighting style and come up with a kind of mixture of kendo and samurai and every sword style there's ever been. And, you know, a bit of tennis and a bit of tree chopping. Everything that you could swing at. You can clock it super fast, right? Like that. So as he, as he comes in there, you go... Well, that's good because we've never done yeah. that one before. Yeah. So. When we train actors, we would write a fight that may be a minute long, but that will be in five or six sections of six or seven moves only. So then we just go through really very slowly and then just start picking up the pace. Saves like they used to. We shot a test fight to set this style, this sort of Jedi style. I wrote it very much like a, a game of chess played at a thousand miles an hour. And every single move is a check. There's only one way out of it.
Jedi are like negotiators. They aren't people that go out and blow up planets. They aren't people that shoot down things. They're more of a one-to-one -one combat type. So I just want the form of fighting and the role of the Jedi Knight to be special and more spiritual and uh, more intellectual than just a, a fighter or a superhero or something like that. Listen up. Anyone who's ready, just step outside the marquee and we'll walk you over to the set. Anybody that's available to come over should come over as and when. Thanks. I'll send them down now then. Take them to the set. Yeah. Okay. okay, guys, we're going to go to the set. Go ahead, Bernie. I'm walking over from the base if someone can meet me halfway. The assistant directors as a whole are responsible for organising the day to day running of the shoot and what happens on the set. You would start as a floor runner, which is like a trainee. Then you would become a, a third assistant director. I'll get back to you and let you know. Where you officially have more responsibility. And as a second, I'm responsible for preparing what's going to happen the following day and the following week in terms of liaising with actors, making sure they know when they're coming into work. Morning, Mr. McGregor. Far too early for this <laughs> Preparing the call sheet. Wait a minute. That tells everybody what's happening the following day. That can be changed, John. 5.30. Just let me know. We've got 40 guys. We're starting them here. Marching this way. Straight down. Straight down, being herded this way. This way. Okay. Yeah. All right. Could you divide the uh, foot soldiers into three groups, A, B, and C? 16 people per group. 12. Ben, I've got one more foot soldier for you. With these ones. Group B. You and Group B. Sir. Right, Group B. Thank you very much. If you imagine that the director is your, as a painter, and he's got all these colours, which are the crew. What you've got to do is mix all those things on the palette so he doesn't end up with brown. Yeah, so two more behind, so, and I should have... Yeah, that's it. So what's happened is you've been captured, and when we get to a certain point... Chris, should we get these guys to sit down as well, do you think? Um, they're going to sit down. They're going to sit down. These guys come in and get sat down here. They're already sat down, right? Ben will tell you when to get up. So when you all stood up, OK, Everybody stood up and then march off. OK? All right, shooting. Here we go. All right, here we go then, please. That's not the gun mic, is it? Turn over, please. Turning. And action! Background action! Action! It's the art of the minimum necessary effort. And that's, that's what I try and, try and get everything down to, is the minimum effort required rather than the maximum effort, because if you put maximum effort into everything, you'll do three shots a day. And since we'll have done something like 3,000 shots, you do them as well as you can within the time frame you can allow, and then you stop and move on. That's great, okay, thank you. Okay, cut! Cut! We've cut, thank you. That's lunch, thank you very much. We have broken for lunch. It actually feels odd when there isn't anything to do at lunchtime and you sit down. It feel it, like feels, feel guilty. That feels strange. <laughs> should you should feel be doing like, something. Yeah. All right, one more now without the white droids, please. George, I've come a bit too far that way if you want to line up to where they were. Go to where you start, guys. On the white right, forward a bit, forward a bit. That's it, okay. Just come to here a second. All right. Here we go then, please. 
Turn over. Turning. Speed. 27 Echo, take two and B cameras. And action. Okay, cut. Cut it. Uh, thanks. All right. That's a wrap. Thanks very much. That's a wrap, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Right. See you tomorrow. Okay. That's a wrap. Um, main unit. We wrap at about 8 o'clock, somewhere between 8 and 8.30, and then we're here for about an hour, an hour and a half after that, waiting for people to leave, the actors again. And then making sure we've got everything set for the next day, leaving at about 10 o'clock on an average. Getting up at 5 and getting to bed at... 12 or 12 30. That's pretty normal. Get the foot soldiers out of their costumes. Copy that. And that completes the main unit crowd for the day. Great, thanks. Hi, my name is Cameron Finley. I'm seven years old. I'll be eight on August 30th. Hi, my name is Devin Michael and I'm nine years old. Hi, I'm Mike Wing and I'm eight and a half. Hi, my name is Jake Lloyd and I'm seven years old. Hi, my name is Justin Burfield and I'm nine. <laughs> George wrote it knowing that it would be an incredible task to find the right child actor. He had every imaginable element built into this kid, from mechanical ability to earnestness. His look was important, his intelligence. And usually children's roles aren't that complex. And in Anakin, you had to have it all. We tested literally thousands of kids. We went all over the world for three years, doing tests, shooting tapes. We looked in England and Ireland and Scotland and in North America and Canada and the States, and it was a process of just going to every single location and contacting the agents, contacting the schools, and kind of throwing out this big net, bringing in as many boys as I could. I think I actually interviewed about 3,000 Anakins. And from that 3,000, I narrowed it down to three boys. Scene 1A, take one. Scene 1A, take two. Scene 1A, take one. They had to be really good actors. They had to be uh, kind of wise beyond their years. Uh, and they had to have a, a good charisma, a good personal quality about them that uh, could carry this kind of a film. We decided to, to bring them all up to do a test screen at the ranch with George directing. That's a huge thing for a little boy to think that he could be the next Anakin Skywalker. I mean, in their world, that's mammoth. This is Natalie. Hi. Hi. All right. So Anakin is a little boy who lives with his mother on Tatooine. You all know where Tatooine is. Yeah. It's a desert planet. And um, he works in this little shop that sells used spaceship parts. There's very few children who can actually act because acting is experience and, you know, kids have limited experience. You've never met each other, so this is the first, okay. first time you've ever said anything to each other. Scene one, take one. And action. I'm a pilot, you know. And someday, I'm gonna fly away from this place. You're a pilot? All my life. I'm a pilot, you know. And someday, I'm gonna fly away from this place. You're a pilot? All my life. I'm a pilot, you know. Someday, I'm gonna fly away from this place. You're a pilot? All my life. <laughs> You're just a little boy. I won't always be. I won't always be. I won't always be. Great. Perfect. We had Leia and Luke. And then from that, we had to draw who their parents could or would be. And so we're kind of going backwards. Natalie had to look like Carrie Fisher, and Anakin had to look like Mark Hamill. I was matching parents to children, and I was matching an ensemble cast. 
think you have to be a bit of a um, investigator, and you, you have to enjoy the chase. I'll start with me. I'm Rick. I'm the producer. <clears throat> Are you and McGregor? Are you and Kenobi? I'm George. I'm responsible for all of this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Jake, and I'm playing Anakin Skywalker. Racist. Everyone came to the table equal, and everyone had an equal shot at it. It's just who's right for the role, and that was the only qualifier that I had to work within. One of the most important things in this particular character is that he is a wonderfully nice boy. Uh, and then there's this very intuitive kind of gut feel you get about that's the one. With Jake, I just got that feeling. I'm a pilot, you know, and someday I'm going to fly away from this place. When you're a writer, it's an ideal world. You can create anything that you want to. But that translation from the written page to reality, therein lies the nature of my job. My sole function in life is to make what George wants physically happen. One thing I knew from the beginning was that Anakin was from Tatooine. There's no way you can really physically recreate that in any stage environment or even backlog environment. You have to go there. So, very early on, Gavin and I went on a location scout to Tunisia. And we found an area in Tozur. We figured if we went about 15, 20 miles outside of the city, in the middle of uh, the desert, we could build our own town and make it as big as George wanted to do. <laughs> OK, so these are all the pieces we get to play with. We could use that as the, as the cafe. Mm -hmm. I want to redress it, take that side. The questions would become is how much more do we need? We're talking about building this until zero now, right? Yes. There's a wonderful art director that we hired called Ben Scott, and we put him in charge of setting up the huge construction job of building virtually a, a city in the middle of the desert. Is this where the cafe would be? Yeah. Yeah. So this is the cafe here. This is where um, this is where Sabulba has a confrontation. All these things have been made in England and then brought over here. The most difficult scene to deal with in the desert was definitely the Padre scene. George was thinking about it like a 747 type engine. I mean, they're two, three stories high, they're 15, 16 feet long. It took us about three and a half months to build the 18 engines that we eventually sent to Tunisia. The movement of a crew to a location, it's like moving a small platoon across the desert. It's a campaign. And that brings a lot of complications. But it's really like war now. And turn over. 76, George, straight to A camera. And action. It was 138, 140, 145 degrees every day. By 11 o'clock in the morning, you were so fried, um, you could barely think. By 1, um, you'd lost 3 or 4 pounds of weight. You feel like every bit of liquid in your body is boiling. Just tell everyone to look to see if they have water next to them. If they have water, it has to go. We do not work on a normal level. We arrive and we shoot, we shoot, and nothing stops us shooting, no matter what the natural disaster that, we had, that hits us. As we drove back to the hotel after our third day of shooting, I saw some lightning in the far distance. I was kind of alarmed by the lightning, but I figured it would pass during the evening. Sat down to dinner, and all of a sudden, all hell broke loose. 
لا لا هو من الاول في الاول معناها جاء جاء رمل ونسمع ات بيجينينغ ات واز ويند اند ذا ساند بلو اب And we couldn't get radio to contact with our security guards because they were holed up in the toilet. Uh, and uh, they, uh, they all uh, uh, ran to the toilet. Uh, and they all ran to the toilet and they shut uh, themselves in the toilet. I mean, the main thing here is not to have panic and everybody just to be running all over the place. I think we have to head up little teams of people and work methodically through it. It was devastating. You know, I figured maybe the tents would have been gone, but everything was gone. Let's get in here with Trish. Remove the wall from the roof. Push the roof into the middle with the poles and pull the wall off, and then you'll find your belongings underneath. You guys got the manpower, though, for the moment? Well, I think if moment, we get yeah, through this, yeah. yeah. OK. Liam's wig, how's that? They're, they're working on They're still finding bits and pieces. All right. Their moustaches and stuff. It's only one piece. No, it's not. It, it, it. The engine sets, look at that. That is grim. Is it okay? We have Anakin, the little boy. These are his engines, which play the most crucial part in the movie. They're split in two, which um, doesn't look good. Yeah, this is heartbreaking. It is heartbreaking. All right, I think, you know, again, if we push this back to the end, mm -hmm. I mean, if we can live with Anakin working on one engine, we've got the replacement pod, which is in good shape. This is pretty good shape. There's a little battering, but nothing yeah. that can't be fixed up. This piece we can actually crack. George was totally calm about the storm. The same thing had happened to him on the first Star Wars film. I say it's good luck. It is good luck. It happened, it happened last and time and it happened this time. Almost, it's like reliving it. Either you give up and you say, oh, well, let's go back to bed and you panic. The only real thing you can do is just try and get people to rally around the task at hand. Luckily, we had this one set that we could still continue to shoot on. Pushing the pod race to the very end of the schedule. We never lost a beat after that, and we walked out of Tunisia the exact day that we were supposed to. I love shooting on location. I mean, that's my favorite. If you're working on a stage, it's always achievable. But when you're on location, you never know what's going to happen. Now, do you need that one down, George? You think they'll get away? They want here? Yeah, we do. No problem. <laughs> Can you get the local boys just to get that one last pod down, the red one over here? When we finally did shoot the pods, I volunteered to shoot a wide shot of the scene from a crane. One of the things that I could see that was so wonderful was not only all of our pods rebuilt, but beyond that sand dune was our whole base camp, which had been completely rebuilt. And to see it all working, seeing the second unit about a half a mile away, actually shooting, seeing the first unit prepping for our biggest scene in the movie. It was joy, it was pure bliss. I hit the mountaintop. Perfect day. George said that this film is definitely a costume drama, especially for the Queen. We looked all over to find inspiration for her costumes, and I mean, Mongolia and Tibet and just everywhere. Okay, some suggestions for some of those new costumes. Ooh, this is in the right direction. Okay. If you could make that line more like this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I am nervous about all of the costumes actually working. Um, I, was, I was paranoid until I went to London and discovered what a real costume designer does. The baton has passed to her. What was drawn now has to be made real. She's going to make it happen. Say two meters in the yellow going to pink. Would that be? Okay. We started off originally with only five costumes for the Queen, 
by the time we actually started filming, I think we'd increased that to 10 or 11 costumes. And I don't think we see her twice in the same costume throughout the whole film. Because we're filming outside, we wanted a fabric that would move in a breeze. So we would have the breeze rippling through the top layers of her cloak. It's about, it's got to be about 250 petals on here now. And it'll probably be about a total of a couple of days shooting. So we do all this work and it's only for about two days. What is this part of the coat, I think? But I've made red. I it? think that would be safer being part of the underdress in a way. I very scrupulously avoided fashion in the first three movies. I just, I, I got around it, I just avoided it. But I was discovering more and more on this one. You know, I walked right into fashion on this one, and I have not balked, so I'm going to be faced with it. It'll be very interesting to see what happens. So this is red, and then this is red. It's pretty intense. <laughs> <laughs> now, the major change um, from talking to George last night, mm -hmm. quite like this dress, to be an absolute cross-cut tube dress. Oh, right. Without so that is a, the full fullness. Major, without any fullness. So oh, it's quite slinky. <laughs> I think you quite like the idea of being able to see through it. Yes, well, it is, it is lovely, mm -hmm. isn't it? Yeah. I've asked if George could come at the end of lunch and have a look at it, um, so that you can just sort of see it before we get it completely finished. Yeah. Hmm. Mike, could you maybe hold this for me? Yeah. Okay. Just drop that down a bit. Yep, I think that looks good. Very good. We got the effect that George wanted, which was a wedding dress that would be symbolic of happiness, possibly an ongoing relationship, perhaps. We're now about four or five weeks from actually from the end of the filming. We're still working and making costumes to be used next week, the week after. And again, please. and again, if you wouldn't mind. We made well over a thousand costumes. We need an R2 that could actually go in very deep sand. We need an R2 that could work in light sand. We needed a R2 that could go over door jams. But I think something in the fundamental design of that three-legged character has always been a difficult process. R2 units are astrodroids. They're a spaceship mechanic that just goes along to, uh, to fix the ship if it breaks down. R2-D2 has always been a problem, and it takes a lot of very clever engineering to make him reliable and make him do the things that he has to be able to do. All we're doing is we're bringing him up to date inside, because when, when you're looking here, it's amazing. It's a trip into the museum almost, because all this 20 years ago, we're also going to get the weight low. He was top heavy before, which I think caused him to tend to want to fall over quite, quite easily. <laughs> <Yeah. So. laughs> we now have seven R2-D2s, which can run on either the sand or on the stage, plus one Kenny Baker one, plus one we call the pneumatic one, which means it can go from two legs to three legs. R2-D2 actually, loving little creature that he is, turned into quite a nightmare for us. Now, the first sets that we were on were Anakin's hovel, which meant R2 had to come in from outside, and the floor was uneven, so that was causing him to skid off at various angles, making him very difficult to control. 
The sand was getting in the chains and, and just locking the motors up and they were shearing shafts and gearboxes. Day by day we were getting frustrated. You know, and it's one thing when you're dealing with an actor, you may do four, five, six, seven takes, but when you have a character that's been around for 20 years um, that is run by a pretty simple mechanism, you expect him to be able to work. <laughs> Cut. Cut. I have bad droid karma. On Jedi, the droids just were perfect. R2 could do anything. He was amazing. We had 15 of them. And he went out in the forest, he went in the forest, in the desert, everywhere. And action! Cut. Cut. Yeah, I think we'll give up on this. Halfway through, George was pretty frustrated by having to wait around for R2. And it frustrated all of us because we spent so much effort and time and money trying to get him to be right. It was at that point where I said, okay, let's just do a huge event. Let's try and create the final R2, the R2 that can last forever. Okay. ILM did one version, and then our special effects department in England did another version. It wasn't a spare no expense experiment. But it was an experiment to see if two different groups of people could come up with some kind of mechanism to allow him to be a little bit more uh, reliable. We got the two wheelchair motors that could push 440 pounds and uh, created the new one, the Uber R2. We produced a completely different foot and motor drive system to get him to run on sand. And we got him running quite nicely in Tunisia. Is this the American one? Yeah. I'll just have to run him over and wreck it, otherwise he put me out of business. <laughs> this is the other answer, is it? Yes. yes. And they both, without consulting each other, came up with their own design, which was very similar. Finally, we have the definitive R2 who can do just about anything now. He can go through the sand, over door jams. He can move quickly. But sadly, life isn't perfect. We still have people who have to operate R2 by radio control. this process of making Star Wars. Our director is back in the booth here somewhere is George Lucas. And uh, I'll thank you for him also. Glad you're here. <laughs> We're going to begin today's work with the woodwind setting at 33. Just winds, please, 33. One, <coughs> two, three. <coughs> You know what I think? I think I would like better if the contra plays first and third beat only, and short. Do it again, please, people. One, two, three, four. On the original films, I was looking for somebody who really understood classical movie scoring, and I was talking to Steve Spielberg about it, and he had worked with Johnny on Jaws and said, you know, this is the man for you. He's perfect. He really understands that medium. And once I worked with him on Star Wars, you know, I wouldn't have anybody else doing it. I've been uniquely fortunate to continue to accompany George on this great journey that he's on. 
which seems now to be a, a life's work journey. He probably rang me a year ago to tell me that, that the time was coming, that this script was, was going to be ready and that he was about ready to shoot the film and that the music would be needed by such and such a time in the calendar. And then I would get another phone call two or three months later and he would fix a spotting date where we go in, in a dark room and talk about where the music is going to go and what it should do, etc. Then it goes from that into religioso force. Yeah. It just has to be something that kind of says, we're fighting back now. But I think we need to keep that yeah. kind of fighting back theme going to, to keep the energy up. The great sword fight at the end of the film, the decision to make that choral was just the result of my thinking that it should be, that it should have a kind of ritualistic or quasi-religious feeling to it, if you like. And that the introduction of a chorus might be just the thing. One, two, three. People, I think always kura, ratama, all of that. I've chosen these Sanskrit words because of the, the quality of the vowels. Do it again, please. See how pure a choral sound you can get. Don't force it. So, so. That's better. And the medium of chorus and orchestra would would give us a sense that we're in a big temple. It's a wonderful piece of music with the choir and the whole, it's very operatic and, and very much like Star Wars. Johnny really understands movie music. It's not just music laid in there, it actually tells the story. Of it. 